Welcome to Caregiving Club On Air. This podcast is dedicated to the millions of family caregivers who want wellness tips and self-care solutions, who seek expert advice, and who want news about healthy aging and how to create well home design in our forever homes. I'm Sherry Snelling, a corporate gerontologist, author, and educator, a TV interviewer, host, and news commentator. I'm joining you from Southern California, where our interviews and news take us all across the country to explore the many ways to help you on your caregiving journey and to lift you up here at Caregiving Club On Air. Hi, everybody, to Caregiving Club On Air and our July episode on National Sandwich Generation Month. Caregiver Self-Care and the Caregiver Bill of Rights, also Forest Bathing, and Happy Birthday, Norman Lear. I'm your host, Sherry Snelling, and we have a fantastic interview for you today with Alexandra Drain, who is the CEO and co-founder of Archangels, and she's going to tell us about her organization and also the way for you to get your score on how you're doing as a caregiver, but we're going to focus our conversation around the sandwich generation, because as I said, July is National Sandwich Generation Month, so we want to celebrate all those caregivers who are caring for both younger children or children under 18, as well as older parents and grandparents. And then caregiver self-care news, we're going to switch to some of those self-care tips, and we're going to take a look at forest bathing because July is also National Forest Month, and there, it's a wonderful way to really immerse yourself in a multi-sensory uh, environment. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then as we turn to Well Home Design News, I'm going to share with you my three Ps, uh, which is a planning model for whether or not you want to have older parents or even grandparents move in with you or consider maybe like an ADU. And then as I mentioned, we're going to do a shout out to our dear friend, Norman Lear, who is right now age 100, but he'll be turning 101 on July 27th, which is really exciting. And then finally, we'll end with our Me Time Monday wellness hack, which is going to be the Caregiver Bill of Rights. And we will tell you a little bit more about that as we get into the episode here. So with that, let's dive into Caregiver Wellness News. So for caregiver wellness news, as I said at the top of the episode, July is actually National Sandwich Generation Month, and it's also the month that we celebrate self-care, which couldn't be perfect, uh, more perfect for me, because those are two topics that are near and dear to my heart and have been for the over 18 years now that I've been working in this space of family caregiving. And we're going to get into some really, I think, interesting tips and, and different resources, and certainly our interview, which is coming up with Alexandra Drain of Archangels, we're going to focus a little little bit on mental health, which is so important. Um, and along those lines, I wanted to, to first share with you a couple of things that are happening that I thought would be really interesting. So our uh, dear friend, Richard Louie, who is a news anchor at NBC, and that's just one of his many jobs. Um, he's also an author and a documentarian and filmmaker. And um, actually, I interviewed Richard on season one, episode two of this podcast. He was so wonderful to come on when I had just started doing all of this. And he talked at that time about a documentary he had done on young um, caregivers who were in their teens or early 20s who were caring for a parent or grandparent who had been a veteran. So it had a real military focus and it was called Sky Blossom, which is just a fantastic film if you haven't seen it. Really underscores, I think, the fact that um, caregiving is is ageless in our society. It's not about being a certain age or the, the person you're caring for being a certain age. It can happen really at any point in our lives. And, and it was a really well done documentary. Well, Richard's at it again. Um, he's got another fantastic documentary out. And this one is focused around the aspects of caregiving and mental health. And it's called Unconditional. Now, this one is streaming on PBS. And I had recently watched it. And again, just amazingly well done. Really, you know, Richard is so perfect at focusing on the themes in caregiving, which are so important to us and, and that we don't often talk about, you know, those things like like the emotional impact and mental health impact of caregiving and burnout and anxiety and depression and all those things that we know that family caregivers can feel 
And and I would throw two more in there, by the way, guilt and grief, because we know those are, are two more emotions that are often very tied to our caregiving roles and responsibilities. But it's a really uplifting documentary. I think you'll really enjoy it. And I just wanted to read you a few stats because I thought this was really interesting. And this this also shows you kind of where Richard is coming from because he is so he's so thoughtful about the details. So um this film, this documentary that he just did, Unconditional, it took seven years to get it to screen, which is not typically unusual in the world of Hollywood. And, um, you know, he talks about mental health affecting over 100 million Americans. And these these stories, he focuses on three stories. And he's one of them, by the way, because his father, he has been a caregiver for his father now for a few years. And he crisscrosses the country because he lives in New York, his mother and father live in San Francisco, and his father was a former pastor and a social worker for people who had mental health issues. So this is really poignant for him. And so he's one of the stories in the documentary. Um, but uh, the producers, the executive producers behind this were, of course, Maria Shriver and also Montel Williams, uh, Lauren Miller Rogan. Uh, who, of course, as you probably know, is the wife of Seth Rogen, and be, the two of them started Hilarity for Charity, which focuses on Alzheimer's awareness among uh, our millennial and Gen Z or iGen generations, and also former Olympian uh, Lori Hernandez. And 100% of the crew were women. So big shout out to all of those executive producers and especially Richard for making that happen. I think that's a really wonderful commentary on this because we know that despite the fact there are, uh, you know, almost half of our family caregivers now are men, we still feel and see, I think, a little bit more of the intensity and the emotional health burden with women. Now, we're going to talk to Alexandra about that, and she's got some insights, but I do feel that, and particularly in the Alzheimer's community and Alzheimer's caregiving, because two-thirds of adults with Alzheimer's are women, and the majority, 66% of the family caregivers for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia are women. So that that is one area, I think, where we see women much more impacted by family caregiving. Um, but the stories are about a loved one with terminal cancer, of course, Richard's story with his dad who has Alzheimer's, and then also a young family who is dealing with a veteran who has PTSD. So very interesting, great information, and I think you'll really enjoy that documentary. Now, switching to something um, that's really uplifting around self-care, as you know, my new book is coming out. I'm sorry, I have to keep promoting it. It's next month in August, and it is um, Me Time Monday, the weekly wellness plan to find balance and joy for a busy life. I think that's a theme that all of us can resonate with. Uh, one of the areas that I researched and that I have in the book is around forest bathing. And what's really interesting is this this kind of um, you know emerged in Japan a few years ago. And um, there's a lot of health benefits to taking a walk or a hike in a forest and really kind of, you know, don't don't have your iPod, you know, or earbuds in, um, you know, just listening to the sounds of the forest and immersing yourself in that multi-sensory because you're you're smelling the pine or, you know, the trees or, or wherever you are, you're um, seeing this beautiful visual um, you know, you're hearing those wonderful sounds. Uh, you're even kind of kind of tasting the air, which tastes a little bit different because you, you're getting all the photosynthesis photosynthesis uh, coming from the chlorophyll off of the trees, which is oxygenating your lungs. And this is what I write about in my book. The health benefits of this are just tremendous. And in fact, I want to read you a couple of things. So forest bathing in Japan is known as Shinrin, Shinrin Yoku. That is the official name for it. And it, what that means is luxurating um, in the trees. And so in 1982, the National Health Program in Japan recognized forest bathing as a health benefit. It's kind of one of maybe those social determinants of health. And um, now there are 48 official forest therapy trails all across Japan. They have over 2 million uh, people a year who are experiencing forest bathing. And here's the, the medical study behind it, which I found really fascinating. So forest bathing increases your natural killer cells. And as we know, those are really, really important, particularly when we're fighting chronic illnesses like cancer. Um, it's the white blood cells that attack and remove the viruses and tumors from your body. So right there alone, you can see the benefit of something like forest bathing. And so really the trees become lifesavers, right? 
And so what the research showed is after two hours of forest bathing walks, the average sleep time, so sleep, which is so important to our overall health, um, of the participants in the study increased by 15%. And what that meant is that those study participants were getting 54 more minutes of sleep per night. Now, that is amazing, right? Because we keep saying to everybody, get your seven to eight hours of sleep. Most of us don't really get that much. And it's all very personalized. I talk about this in the book. Um, you know, all of us are different. We need different things in our lives in terms of health. So you may feel like you're doing okay without that seven to eight hours. But for the most part, you know, when we talk about sleep and, and we've done a whole episode around sleep science, um, you really do need to give your body time to repair because that's what's going on, right? The brain is at work at night when you're sleeping and it's repairing your muscles and repairing your cells. Uh, it's imprinting those memories from the day. It's modulating the intense emotions that you had during the day. So that sleep really is important for a lot of reasons. And again, I go through all the details in my book about that. But I thought you'd find that really interesting because also what they found from forest bathing is that on a generalized anxiety survey, so generalized anxiety disorder is something that affects um, a lot of Americans. In fact, one in five Americans have higher anxiety levels. So on the um, of the participants in this forest bathing, their anxiety levels came down. So you can see how many benefits there is to just being out in nature. If you don't have a forest right outside your back door, you know, hopefully there's a park or someplace with some beautiful trees or greenery. All of this nature really plays a key role in neuroscience and how our brains work. And it really helps to calm our bodies, heal our bodies, heal our minds, and help us keep going and give us that strength and that stamina and even that resiliency that we need. So with that, I'm going to get off my forest bathing hook, but hopefully I gave you enough good information to think about it. And, and again, I'll have some links on the episode guide page for where you can find some of these great trails. And you can either do it on your own or you can get an experienced trail guide who is almost like a yoga instructor that'll lead you or lead a group. And again, it's a very quiet experience, but they'll kind of give you some of those cues on what to be thinking about while you're walking through these forests in the U.S. And there's an amazing number of them, which is really wonderful. Now, I want to just turn really quickly before we get to the interview with Alexandra, I want to just do a shout out to Norman Lear. And, you know, Norman has become a, a wonderful acquaintance. And I want to even go as far as to say kind of a dear friend. Um, years ago, I uh, kind of accosted him at the Milken Institute. He had he had uh, been on a panel with a dear friend of mine, um, Alex Witt of MSNBC, who was uh, moderating a panel with him. And I went up to the two of them afterwards, and I kind of recruited him to come and be a keynote speaker at a great conference that's put on by Mary Furlong called the What's Next Longevity uh, Venture Summit. And he he agreed to do it, and he had a new book out, so of course that was great for him. But at the time, he was uh, 94, 95 years old, and amazingly spry in terms of, you know, being able to get around. Um, you know, he couldn't walk far distances, as he told me, but his mind was so sharp, and he was in the middle of doing you know, a rap video for YouTube. He had just rebooted One Day at a Time, which was one of his famous series for Netflix with an all Latino cast. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Norman Lear, shame on you. Um, but let me just tell you, you may know about Shonda Rhimes and all of her prolific TV shows that she has on all at once. But Norman actually had six television shows, different shows that were in the top 10 watch shows um, back in the 70s. And that included show, famous shows like All in the Family and One Day at a Time. Uh, he's absolutely prolific. He is the number one TV showrunner, I think. He's has has over 100 different series that he's developed. And just wrote, most recently, <clears throat> he actually did a documentary on Rita Marino. So he's still he's still pumping out content and uh, and living a great life. And he's 100 years old right now, but he turns 101 on July 27th. So I just want to do a shout out to Norman and wish him a happy birthday. And also I thought it was kind of great to tie him into this episode because he purchased a copy of the Declaration of Independence called a Dunlop Broadside. There's only 25 of them that exist in the world today. And they were obviously printed in 1776. And it was to inspire our, our revolutionary troops at the time to keep up the good fight, to win our freedom and our independence from the British. And so he purchased this uh, Declaration of Independence and then 
He toured it around the country because he wanted all Americans to see the birth certificate of America. I thought, what a beautiful thought. And that's the kind of person that Norman Lear is. He's just, as, as they say, he's a mensch and he's a wonderful person. And I feel really privileged and grateful that I've had the opportunity to to interview him for articles for PBS and to talk to him and spend some time with him. So again, happy birthday, Norman. We really love you. So with that, I'm going to turn to another really passionate advocate who is helping out Americans, and that is Alexandra Drain, CEO and co-founder of Archangels. And she's going to tell us about our organization, but also there is a, a sort of a, a, a test, if you will, or some questions you can take that are going to tell you where you fall on this caregiver intensity index. Really important. And so let's have Alexandra tell us more. So I am really excited to have our guest on the episode today, and her name is Alexandra Drain. She is the CEO and co-founder of Archangels, and, you know, it's July National Sandwich Generation Month, as I've said earlier, and Alexandra's done some really phenomenal work in working with caregivers and specifically the sandwich generation. So Alexandra, welcome to Caregiving Club on Air. I'm super honored to be here, as you know, because you and I share lots of things, including an obsession and passion for supporting this extraordinary population. Absolutely. And I was really inspired because I saw you speak recently at a Techstars event and you were talking, you know, so eloquently about caregiving and your own experiences and everything. But first of all, I want you to tell our audience, what is Archangels? What is it that you you guys do? You know, on my more radical days, I would say we are a revolution. Um, on my days where I'm feeling more zen, I would say, I would describe us really as a combination of a movement and a platform. And our unbelievably obsessive focus on ha- is how we reframe how this population of unpaid caregivers are seen and honored and supported. And at a very high level, we do a lot of research because we know that data gives the brains of people who have the power to change budgets or change policy or regulations to make those changes. But we know unpaid caregivers are very unlikely to realize they're in that role. So we, our platform itself, uses that data to run campaigns to get people's intensity validated and then to navigate them over to resources that often exist. But if you don't know you're in the role in the first place, or you do, and you're probably also therefore overwhelmed, you don't realize the stuff that might exist for free through your community or your state or through your employer, through employee assistance programs or other um, avenues. And then all of that creates impact for the individual. It creates impact for the organizing body, be that an employer or a health plan or a health system. And it obviously can roll all that data up from a policy and advocacy perspective um, in defining and sort of directing where budgets go for communities, for states. And now we're increasingly seeing interest from the federal government. Thank you to the director of Medicare, Mina Sashimani. Thank you to Biden for his executive order and calling even more attention to this to this role. Well, it is so important. You know, I know that the official statistic is that we've got 53 million Americans who are in a family caregiving role. And as you mentioned earlier, unpaid, overlooked, overwhelmed, all of those those things that we know can happen. And and when I heard you speak, you actually took that number, 53 million. I think you said that it actually has increased. So we're actually even looking at a higher number now. And sandwich generation, of course, are the caregivers squeezed between still caring for maybe, you know, children under 18 or just come back from college and still under your roof and your care, as well as your older parents or grandparents. But tell us a little bit about the Caregiver Intensity Index, which I I find to be such a wonderful tool. Mm-hmm. And you you give a score out, and I want you to explain to us what that is, and then how can people tap into that? Oh, I love you, Sherry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. One, I, I do think it's important to know that before COVID, there was a beautiful study by NAC and AARP, shout out to both of them, that did peg the number of adults in the U.S. who are in this role at 53 million. I can tell you that we published four studies, three with the CDC and one with the Journal of Affective Disorders during COVID. And we are now looking at 40 3% of adults in the U.S. are in this role. And what's interesting about it is often the image that comes to somebody's mind is a woman, and she's 50, 55, and she's caring for her mother. 
And that is true. And she is. And there are also, there's such a broader spectrum. You know, one in four caregivers are millennial, at least. This was a pre-COVID number, one in five Gen Z. About 40 to 50% are men, depending on the study that you're looking at. And we see this play out over and over and over again. So if you think about that 43% of adults, it basically means close to one in two of us are in this role. And we're not, you know, we might be we see caregivers nowadays who are in elementary school. We see them in middle school. We see them in high school. Families, intergenerational families in particular, are making intelligent, informed decisions about who's going to watch over the auntie or the grandmother or the great grandfather, right? right? And someone's got to go to work and someone's got to go to school. And how does this all play out? So the intensity index, if you come back to that original premise for Archangels, which is first and foremost, is people need to see that they're in this role. They have to realize they're in this role. And only about 50% of people, and that's a pretty healthy number, I'd say it's actually less than that, have any recollection at all that they are an unpaid caregiver. Because in their mind, the language that they feel is that caregiver is for you know a nurse or a tech or a doctor. It's a paid role. And right. they will often say to us, especially in a rural community, males, communities of color, they'll say, I am not a caregiver. I am right. just, and then they say the most beautiful things. I am just a son, a daughter, a God-fearing person, a loving neighbor, a friend. And right. so we run campaigns that we say we're shameless hustlers that use any word possible, any visual possible to get at these other broader definitions and populations. And then we get people to get their score. And it's interesting, people talk a lot about surveys. I am not a fan of surveys. I'm 51 years old and I've worked in the health system and in the world that is trying to connect humans that need things with things that exist to support that need and never the twain connect, right? So frequently right. there's populations that have real need and there's resources that have been created, but they can't find each other. Right. And so the crux of Archangels is we're going to run these campaigns that are sexy as appropriate or serious but or humorous. They're going to find this population, and then they're going to get that reality for that individual validated. And we use the word intensity with enormous intent, because mm -hmm. intensity means a lot of things, right? Intensity right. can be the intensity of my love for my dad, for example, who's 82, and just he's my person. Mm -hmm. The intensity of worry that I might feel for my dad. You mentioned, I got an 18-year-old. Oh, goodness, Sherry, how much time do you have? About the intensity <laughs> of panic, intensity of pride. Right? right? So being an unpaid caregiver creates a lot of intensity. And so what we do is it's not a survey. It's a validation tool that takes about two minutes. And someone answers a couple of questions, about two and a half minutes worth of questions. And in the end, they get a score. And that score puts them in the green, yellow, or red. And just for context, if you're in the red, over 90% of us have at least one mental health impact. So in the red means you're in the red. And then it tells you the top two things driving that intensity and the top two things alleviating that intensity. We don't do a long list. It's a very short list. And then it gives you a chance to navigate right then, if you want to, if you have time, to resources that exist to help. And they're not Archangel's resources per se. They're resources that the state might offer. They're resources. There are a lot of beautiful organizations, or it might be your employer has invested in things that you don't know are available and will navigate you to those things as well. Well, and I love that. You know, I really used your data and your insights in my latest book, Me Time Monday. I have to do a little plug for my book Shout coming out, out in August. Yes. But your data was really so important in the research that I was doing. And as you said, you know, we've got five generations who are in this role of family caregiver. And I don't think we think about that a lot. And one of the things I talk about in the book is that this, we have a new generation, you know, not millennials, not boomers, generation caregiver, generation C. And that's really cross-cutting, uh, you know, across all generations, all ages. And then we've got the self-care piece. And one of the things I love about your caregiver in, in intensity index is that you said, you know, it's not a survey and also it's, it's positive. It's like, let's see where you're at. You know, maybe there are some really great things and that encourages you in what you're doing. And maybe there are some like little warning bells over here then it sounds like you personalize a lot of the tools that someone can get, which I think is so valuable for everybody out there listening to us to take this survey and really kind of figure out where you're at and then what are, what are the needs. So tell me a little bit, there were some alarming statistics and insights, again, maybe going back a bit to the pandemic, but what are you seeing now, now that we've kind of come through that, 
where is the intensity index that you're seeing in the people who are who are taking this and looking at their scores? Yeah. So a couple things. One, um, I, I got it since you're talking about sandwich generation, and this is, as you mentioned, sandwich generation awareness month. And as you know, we hear this, we've 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 crept all over the stuff that you do, Sherry, and we really love it. And one of the things that you make a point of is that unpaid caregiving is a it's a forever thing, right? You're not like, yes, this is the month that celebrates it, and thank goodness, let's call attention to this sandwich generation population. And by the way, when the month is over, the job doesn't go away. Nice. And to your point about there being positive bits and harder bits, you know, why do we name ourselves archangels? Because we think it's beautiful. And we are, it's not just destigmatizing, it's not just normalizing. We want to aspirationalize. Like this population is like your warrior angels and you are spreading your wings out over these people that you care for. And we think if you're an employer and you work in a care economy, which we do now, you should be rushing to go find this population and love on them, no matter what industry you're actually in. But if you think about the state of intensity before, during, and after COVID, if we want to say we're after COVID now, the jury could be out on that. (laughs) Before COVID, about 8% of us were in the red. And again, remember, if you're in the red, it's 90% of us have a mental health impact, anxiety, depression, or suicidal ideation. So it's kind of a one-to-one. Right. For the 20 months that most would sort of say was the the most, you know, agreed upon time of COVID, it tripled. 24% of us were in the red. Wow. And then I think there was a period of time starting about 120 days ago where folks might have hoped, okay, it's releasing its grip on our economy, on our lives, on our mental health. If you look at the data, it does not say that at all. In fact, in the last three to six months, we're now at about 28.5% are in the red for all mm-hmm. the reasons that you know, which is why you dedicate yourself to this, right? If you're an right. unpaid caregiver, you are already spending $7,000 out of pocket on this role that you play. What about inflation that we know has happened? Gas, food. Well, if you're an unpaid caregiver, you're buying food for these people that you're caring for often, right? You're driving places to care for folks. What about how many of us had supportive infrastructure to support the caring and feeding of those that we love? Daycare is closed, elder care closed, try getting a home care aid on the schedule that you want. You can't, right? Right. So as the infrastructure crumbled, which we know it especially did for the unpaid caregiver population, and the world released and we're getting called back to our office if we were lucky enough to work from home, what do we do? Because this other beautiful job that we have didn't go away. And we still have these responsibilities, but we don't have a way to do it. So Mm -hmm. I think that arc, we are feeling very strongly right now. And then the last component of it, and I, you know, I will challenge you. And I think the role that you do, Sherry, I would argue you are what we call the double duty caregiver, because (laughs) you're like a paid caregiver. You're caring for me right now. Anyone who's listening, you are, you're putting your body in a place that you want to find these individuals and you want to help them get seen and supported and navigated over and mostly like loved on, right? Yes. Well, that makes you a paid caregiver. Paid caregivers are disproportionately also unpaid caregivers. The type of person who goes to do the work that you do or goes to be a nurse or a tech or a frontline worker of any kind is disproportionately an unpaid caregiver. That's called a double duty. And I can tell you, if you're a double duty, you have a double the intensity usually. So we'll right. see your intensity is higher because you're kind of surrounded by it in every way, shape or form. Right. Well, and you're right. I mean, think about your job is being a paid caregiver and then you come home and now you're an unpaid caregiver for a family member. And you're right. We see that so often. And what, you know, again, this positivity psychology is really something I buy into. It's one of the things as a gerontologist, you know, I really focus on. Now, when we had Mark Schultz uh, from actually Bryn Mawr, but he works with Robert Waldinger at Harvard University, and they're the two directors of the adult development um, study that's been done over 87 years, I think it is now or whatever. And they're finding that our social fitness, so our social relationships and avoiding, you know, this epidemic of loneliness that the U.S. Surgeon General just put out his report on is so critical. What what are the things that you're seeing or finding in some of, you know, the, the scores and, and, you know, the caregivers that you're loving on and caring on when it comes to the loneliness and the isolation that can come maybe with caregiving? Yeah. So 
first of all, shout out to that work. And I had a, the occasion to meet and spend some time with Robert and he's extraordinary. And all of that work has been extraordinary. You know, one of the most foundational elements of humanity is to care for others and to be cared for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot, you know, what drives happiness in our bones, we want to be a purpose. And one of the gorgeous things about caring for someone else is it taps into that part of us that wants to give. Right. What we are seeing is as humanity has become, you know, less, let's, this is a gross generalization, but for some parts of the population, you're less likely to live in a multi-generational household. You're less likely, even if you are in a home with three other people, people go to their rooms at the end of the day, right? They're not all on top of each other. And there was a beautiful quote that was like, you can be a room with 100, in a room with 100 people and still feel lonely. So the impact of social media. So one of the things that we work on a lot with our work with Archangels is how do we recreate shared language and shared awareness around how beautiful it is to be in this role, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. wherever possible, how can we be encouraging people to keep an eye out for those around them First, they should start by keeping an eye out for them. Are you in this role? And if you are, you talk about self-care. What are you doing to make sure you survive in this role? And we should talk about self-care. I'll let you take the lead on that however you want to because we have lots of thoughts and data on that. But in addition, once you are okay and you are going to survive this moment, we think a lot about how can we scan the horizon? Like a lifeguard is constantly scanning, looking for someone who's drowning. And then they Mm -hmm. throw the light. So we say to anybody, right, keep an eye out on those around you who are in this role. Because one thing you'll never see an unpaid caregiver do is wave their arms and be like, right, and ask for help. Tell me. They don't. And in fact, if you say to them, are you all right? How do I help? They're like, no, no, I'm fine. They're almost too overwhelmed to ask. They don't know where to begin. And so we say, don't ask, just help. Figure out. Is it mowing a lawn, filling a fridge, sitting with a loved one for an hour so someone can take a nap? Right. Um, Those sort of ways to kind of put your body there. And once you start paying attention to how much loneliness there is out there and all the forms that it takes, and you start putting your body there to make a difference, that fills us up. And as dorky as it sounds, some people are like, that's dorky, that's soft. That's not soft. That's hardcore clinically evidenced medicine that it will actually make you healthier, make you more resilient, make you more likely and able to sustain as you keep doing this other work that you're doing, which is to serve as an unpaid caregiver. Right. And I think one of the things that, that Mark had said on the podcast is that, you know, having that person who has your back just goes so far, right. In helping us with our, our mental health, our emotional health, our resiliency, our ability to kind of keep going and keep doing this wonderful work. One of the things I want to talk about, because both you and I work with employers, and we know that in the workplace, this is a huge issue. I mean, as you just said, if you're in an elevator or an office space or wherever, you know, 50% of the people next to you, you know, 50% of the people in that area are going to be a caregiver. And I talk a lot about the social contracts at work. And I think one of the biggest items now on the list for those social contracts is the recognition of the caregiving role that so many employees are playing, you know, outside of their workplace and the flexibility that they need and the, you know, the time um, kind of flexibility and all that other stuff. But tell me a little bit about what your work, how you're working with employers and what you see, what is the response? Do we feel like, you know, workplaces are becoming more caregiver friendly? Yeah, um, I do. So to the point, um, around, you know, what is the single most important thing to help boost our resiliency, to help us stay strong. Um, we had the same data, which is if we know that even one person is in our corner, just one person, it goes the farthest to helping reduce our intensity. And we joke around a lot, like if you're in the red, you need a red phone. So- right. I have, you know, I have a red phone, like Christina has served as my red phone, various friends. And for me, sometimes what I need when I'm in the red is I only have time for 30 seconds. And in that 30 seconds, I'm going to call someone. I'm not going to have time to set up the call. And I'm, this is what I do. This is inappropriate. I just say as many swears as I can. I'm like, because I just, I'm like so stressed and it's all on me. And then I feel better and I hang up, right? right. People have their own ways of like getting that support. And if you have the ability to, just breathe for 30 seconds or go for a walk or whatever it is, that's key. 
but just feeling supported by at least one person is key. And I think for employers, I mean, I, I think that there have been employers over the last five, 10 years who have gone early into this space, recognize the importance of the population, the prevalence of this population. And they've done it because they knew A, it was the right thing to do, and that there was a top and bottom line benefit to being a workplace that is really good at retaining and recruiting the kind of person who's going to be an unpaid caregiver because they're naturally kind of genius. There's a whole other set of employers. I love them. They were busy working on other things. But bam, all of a sudden, they can no longer recruit and they cannot retain. And as they're hiring folks to come in and do analysis to say, why can't, why is nobody staying in their job? Why is everyone taking a leave of absence? Go look at whatever study, whatever report, whatever, you know, scanning of the environment you want to look at. One, two, or three, or one, two, and three will be unpaid caregiving responsibilities. Yeah. And as that supportive infrastructure has gone away, as the financial impact has gone up, as I used to have, you know, just my beautiful 82 year old dad I was caring for now add kids with a mental health impact that's coming out of COVID, add the inequity and disparities that we see depending on where we live, depending on our zip code, and more and more individuals. You know, the thing I want to say to employers is unpaid caregivers want to work. Work is yes. resting for them, gives yes. them purpose, gives them a way to feel like they're adding value. They also need the money. Go back to that $7,000 out of pocket every year. Yep. So supporting this population and helping them stay in their jobs is really a win-win. I think we're finally seeing, fortunately, unfortunately, thanks to COVID, employers who maybe weren't sold, like, oh my gosh, what can you do to help me find the people in my organization, because there are at least 43% of them who are in this right. role, and right. keep and love on them. I need them, and they want to be here. And then all those who I need to hire, I'm going to go find those unpaid caregivers who have got the skill set and who maybe think that they don't have job experience because they've been out of work for the last five years. We're like, you haven't been out of work. You had a freaking job. You were exactly. caring for. Then that's an, you were an accountant. You were a lawyer. You were a personal care attendant. You're a nurse, a psychologist. You're a navigator, right? Yeah. Like, oh, these folks have skills. So yes. I think we've got employers who, for whatever reason, are coming around to. I need to care for this population. And by the way, many of them have spent tons of money investing in employee assistance programs that are grossly underutilized. Yeah. So, hey, we got a brilliant idea. Just get people to realize they're in this role by respecting on them and loving them on, on it, in it. And then navigate yeah. the stuff you already bought. You already paid for it. It's just no one's using it. Hallelujah. And, you know, to your point, I always tell employers, you know, being a caregiver is not a disadvantage because you have empathy, you have emotional intelligence, you know how to juggle a lot of responsibilities, do great research. I mean, these are great skills, right, that any employer should should be looking for and is, is yeah. valuable. Um, you know, we're, we're getting close to time and Alexander, I could talk to you all day. This has just been so fun. And I love your energy and I love it inspires me to see someone like you who is just so passionate about, you know, family caregivers and, and how we can support them. What would be your, your final thoughts and your last message to our audience who is listening, whether they're a family caregiver, or maybe we get a lot of, you know, HR folks too, who are listening to us, but what would be your message to our audience? I think it's the, those two things, most importantly, which is you got to put your own air mask on before helping others. And what we see, so 79% of people, before they quickly get their score, get their intensity level, um, will say on a scale of one to five, oh, I'm a one. Like, I'm not an unpaid caregiver. 79% after that two-minute experience say, oh, my God, I'm a 4.2. Like, I am really a caregiver. And so- I would say to everyone, stop yourself for a second. Take a moment. Go into your belly. Think about what are you doing every day? What is right. taking your time and your emotional energy? What is filling you up? What is sometimes, you know, depleting you? It's caring for others. You yeah. are in this role, whether you see it or not. So take a moment to appreciate that you are. Love on yourself for it. Give yourself grace. The number one thing unpaid caregivers feel is that they're failing on every level. I feel this way all the time. So we got to love on ourselves in this role, put our own air mask on. If you are not physically well enough, and by the way, you will not be if you don't keep your cup full. And this doesn't mean right. you have to go, like, go to a yoga camp for 18 weeks. It means take that 30 seconds, take the three minutes, have a red phone, have a friend who you can talk to about stuff. Right. And then the next thing I would say is, and then start scanning, you know, be that lifeguard, be looking at the landscape and keep an eye out for folks who are in this role. Don't ask, just help. 
insert yourself in their lives. And then selfishly, I hope we find a way to work with you. Selfishly, anyone who's listening, whether you're in an HR position, you're a double duty caregiver. Oh, good Lord, are you? Or you're a human, an individual, an activist who wants to do more for this space. Archangels is we'd love to support you. And there's a bunch of ways we can very easily help someone go from that. That's not me. What the heck are you talking to? Oh my gosh, that's me. And wow, I didn't know this stuff existed. And you just made me feel seen for the first time. And that gives me a little more energy to keep on going. And then how can I go spread that love? Well, and I love that. And everybody's listening. We can we can feel your intensity. We can feel your passion for all of this. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing some of those insights. So again, um, Archangels, you can go take your survey. You can find out where your score is, get connected to some help. Um, also, if you're an employer or other organization and you really want to dig into the insights of our wonderful caregivers, you should check out Archangels' website. And um, Alexander, where can they find that website and that sur- or that where they can take the survey and score. So it's score. archangels.me, M-E, okay. and archangels is spelled A-R-C-H-A-N-G-E-L-S. Okay. And on the homepage, it'll be like, you know, we've got lots, it's for caregivers, it's for organizations, it's for data geeks. So you just go to the part that you want. If you go to the part that's for caregivers and scroll down, there's a place you can get your score. Um, awesome. And the other thing I would say, because I think this will resonate with you because I've heard you talk about it, you can also go to archangels.work. And this is essentially um, a place that you can sort of come to the realization, oh my gosh, I thought I had no job. I have had a job the last five years. And it does kind of like a skill builder. So it helps you translate the skills that you just referenced that you fine-tuned and developed as an unpaid caregiver and think about how to talk about them in a job interview and get them on your resume, right? I love it. And then employers, to your point, Go hire these people. We are in a care economy. There's a beautiful quote from someone from Starbucks. They said, we can't teach you how to, we can teach you how to make a latte. We can't teach you how to care. We need to be caring for folks, hiring those folks who know how to care. Well, I love that. And what a great way to end this wonderful interview. Thank you again, Alexander, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for Welcome Design News, I want to do a couple of things here. First of all, I'm going to share with you what uh, an article that I actually wrote for Porch, and it was called the My Three Three P's Plan, and it was dedicated to people who are mostly sandwich generation caregivers who probably still have um, kids that still live at home, or maybe your kids came back from college and they're bunking at home right now. But you're also thinking about, you know, I wonder if I should have mom and dad or mom or dad, or maybe even grandparents move in with us. You know, maybe it's an ADU, which is a, a you know, an adult dwelling unit in the back, you convert your garage or whatever it is. I wanted to just share with you during this National Sandwich Generation Month, a few tips. And I'm going to have the full article on the episode guide page, but I want to just give you a quick summary here. So I call it the three P plan and it's the three P stand for prevention, privacy, and personalization. So there's a lot of considerations, I think, when we're thinking about maybe having parents move in with us and how is that going to affect everyone in the home? And, you know, how are we all still going to get our personal spaces and all of that? But I think when when we think about older adults, we don't often consider that they're at a different stage of life. And so, you know, what what should we look for? So prevention is really the first one. And again, I'm not going to go through these in too much detail, but, you know, you want to keep things clutter free. So if you've got little kids still and the toys are always in the hallways and stuff, you know, that could be a trip hazard. So you need to think about things like that. Um, You also want to have a bathroom that's dedicated to your older uh, loved ones. I think we all know that I've been told by my friends um, that their marriages stay alive because they have separate bathrooms or at least they have separate sinks. Um, So I think it's the same concept as here is here. You don't want to have to have, you know, grandma sharing a bathroom with the kids or with you or whatever. So that becomes a consideration. Um, And also just making sure that they're not having to maybe climb a lot of stairs. So again, maybe it is that conversion version of a garage or, you know, maybe it's a a guest room downstairs or whatever it is. Um, When it gets to the second P, which is privacy, this is really, this is really key. And I think this is one that we can't overlook. We really have to think this one through because look, we all need our sanctuary places in our homes, right? And that's a place where we can 
kind of find that quiet time. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about the snug home, but you really need to provide some privacy and some ability to get away from the noise. You know, we get a lot more sensitive with our senses. Um, so whether it's hearing or sight or taste or smell as we age. And um, when we hear a lot of noise, it's be, it's very distracting neurologically um, when we are older. So, you know, if you have a TV that's blasting with cartoons or Marvel comics shows or whatever it is, or video games, um, or just a lot of, you know, shouting and rambunctiousness, which, you know, is just normal if you've got kids, that can be really overwhelming for somebody who's older, who's more used to maybe the quiet. So you have to think about that a little bit, because that becomes a really big issue. And then I think also being able to carve out spaces where your loved one feels like this is my sanctuary. I can go here and kind of retreat, but you have to not give up yours as well. So if the room, maybe they're going to take over is your sanctuary place. We don't want you to give that up. We need you to still have that place where you can get to you. So, you know, kind of a little design around those things are important. And then lastly, again, I'm not going into these in too much depth. You'll read about it, but personalization is really key. So the ability for a loved one to move in and say, you know, I always wanted my bedroom to be in you know green colors or I really want to do this you know um, in the, in the room or have this kind of a blanket or whatever so I think allowing that personalization those comfort sources that we all have to come into the environment is really going to make it a much smoother transition for your loved one rather than they feel like they're just a guest and you know they might be living there for several years but you want them to feel like this is their place too. So, you know, there's some things along those lines. And then there's some other tips and things that are in the article that you'll read about. But I just wanted to cover those quickly because I know that I get a lot of questions from caregivers about, you know, um, is it right for me to have my loved one live with me? Um, you know, or should, are they going to be better off if, if they're in, you know, an assisted living because there's more socialization? I work all day, so they're alone or whatever it is. So lots of considerations when you're making those determinations as a family and particularly as a family caregiver of the sandwich generation. Now I would just want to turn really quickly before we get to our Me Time Monday wellness hack. I want to talk about the Snug Home, which as you guys probably know is a blog that I started during the pandemic where I really again was looking at those sanctuary places and I have a whole origin story behind the Snug Home that I won't go into here but it does have some um, some foundation in Britain. It also has a connection to uh, the Navy, which was my stepdad was a proud U.S. Navy man. But when we think of snug, we probably think of snugly, and that is really what it is. It's cozy, comforting. It's a place of sanctuary. And again, I have an article link that I'm going to put on the episode guide page that helps you figure out where you can create your snug place in your home um, that is a place for retreat. It's just for you. It's where you can find your me time. And it can be a really small place, but it is your place. And so I'm going to have that on the episode guide page. And I think that's, again, it's National Self-Care Month. So we've got to think about where, where are the spaces, not just the things that we do, but the environments, I'm really into this these days, by the way, our environments are so important to our physical health and our mental health. And so finding those little snug home places uh, are really important. So again, I'll give you some tips and stuff on the episode guide page, but you know, whether it's a reading nook or a little window bench, or maybe it's a hammock outside in the garden or in the, you know, the backyard or a deck chair, but wherever it is that you can sit, and find calm and maybe do some knitting or some reading or listen to music or just, you know, daydream, uh, which we know is good for health and resiliency. Um, all of these things are in my book, by the way, as well. Me Time Monday, uh, the weekly wellness plan to find balance and joy for a busy life. And with that, we're going to go into the Me Time Monday wellness hack that we do every episode. And this is going to be on the Caregiver Bill of Rights. I'm going to take you through 10 rights that every caregiver should have. This was an article that I wrote, gosh, over 10 years ago, maybe longer for care.caring.com. 
And um, it really got a lot of attention. I've, I've heard people on different podcasts and people started picking up on it. And there was even a movement at one point to actually officially put this into some kind of legislation. But it's it's interesting. And I think, you know, um, however you look at it, I think these are the rights that we should give to all caregivers who basically are our nation's largest volunteer healthcare and long-term care army. So with that, here's our Me Time Monday wellness hack on the Caregiver Bill of Rights. Our Me Time Monday Wellness Hack this episode is the Caregiver Bill of Rights in honor of July 4th, America's birthday, and our Day of Independence. I wrote these 10 Bill of Rights as an article over 10 years ago, and I've dusted it off a little bit in celebration of National Sandwich Generation Month and the millions of caregivers who deserve our support. So the Caregiver Bill of Rights is, again, as I said, it was an article that I wrote and since then, it's gotten a lot of attention. I know that other radio and podcast hosts have talked about it. I know other organizations have taken a look at this and maybe added to it or tweaked the Bill of Rights a little bit. But it's something that's really important for us to consider because of the role that family caregivers play in our society. They're unpaid, they're overlooked, um, overwhelmed, and don't get enough attention and support. And I think it's something that's really important and we need to set aside these Bill of Rights and look at what we can do in these 10 areas that will help out the millions of family caregivers who are out there. So number one is the right to have balance between caring for my loved one and caring for myself. This is really important. You know, sometimes the caregiver Achilles heel is our reluctance to ask for and then accept help from others. And one of the things that we know is really great for both your physical and emotional health is to have routines that you don't give up. So despite the fact you've taken on this added responsibility of caring for your loved one, there there has to be at least one thing a week that you love doing and then figuring out how are you going to find the time to do that. That's one of the things that my new book, Me Time Monday, is all about. But as we take this caregiving journey, we have to look at accepting some of the help from others in order for us to maintain that balance and caring for our loved ones and also caring for ourselves. And also I think it's really important for us to recognize that as family caregivers, we're not alone. We may feel that way, but there are people out there that wanna help us. And again, it could be your circle of care, friends, family members, neighbors, coworkers, or it could be support groups and other people that you don't even know yet, but who are there gonna be there for you. Number two is the right to receive a financial break or tax credit for caring full time for my loved one. This is really important. And there's been a lot of legislation that's moved through, uh, you know, uh, Capitol Hill over the years that I've been doing this. And unfortunately, nothing really significant has really come into play. Uh, We know that there have been different things in different administrations that have that have started to help. But it's really important because, again, if we don't have family caregivers in their role, then the, the whole healthcare system collapse, collapses. And, you know, we need to recognize then the value. I think AARP, who does annual uh, analysis of the value of family caregivers in our society, I think the latest report is, is around $600 billion that our family caregivers are providing in free care to take care of our older loved ones. And we know we're going to get 20 to 30 bonus years of life, but not all those years are going to be spent in good health. We're going to need some help with long-term care. And so we don't have enough professional caregivers. We don't have enough family caregivers. We need to really figure this out because this is not something that is way down the road. This is right in front of us. It's happening now. But coming up with tax credits and coming up with ways to you know, help caregivers who need a break and need that flexibility uh, with what they're doing in their their daily lives is really important. The third is the right to work for an employer that understands and supports caregivers. So I write in my book about the social contract at work, and this was something that I actually studied at MIT as part of a graduate course that I took uh, around social contracts. And it's really important for employers (laughs) to know that one in three, of their employees is in a caregiver role. Now that means somebody that might be caring for a child all the way up through somebody who's caring for a parent or grandparent. And in fact, one in six employees is caring for someone over the age of 50. So again, we're gonna have more and more people who are actually doing elder care 
or senior care versus child care. And we need to recognize that within our workplaces and we need to study, okay, what are the benefits that are needed? What are the supports? What's the flexibility? You know, how do I look at this? And, you know, as, as you heard during the interview with Alexandra Drain, we really need to think about what are the skills that caregivers are building that really show value in the workplace. But all of this is really important and it's it's important for us to recognize as employers that this is a role that just about everybody is going to play at some point. And so not overlook or, you know, consider that caregivers are less productive or less valuable to you just because they are fulfilling this role. They just need a little bit more support, but many of them want to stay on the job and want that that refuge and that respite of coming to work and focusing on something else. Number four is the right to expect the nation's legislators to acknowledge the valuable service that caregivers or I perform and to enact policies that not only support those with the illness or disability, but support their family caregivers as well. So again, this goes back to, you know, I think more of our legislators are now in turn with family caregiving uh, or, you know, in, in sync with that because they're going through it themselves, right? And they recognize that not everybody has the financial wherewithal to to do this. And so what are some of the rules and and, you know, again, going back to maybe tax credits or whatever it happens to be, whether it's paid family leave or other things, we need to figure this out and we need to figure it out so that it, it is helpful to all types of employers because not everybody is a big, huge employer. We've got a lot of small business owners. So what do we do? to help them with their business, but also recognize they're gonna have employees that are caregiving and they they need some help. So these are all of the things that, you know, our nation's legislators need to tackle. And I know they've got a long list of challenges, but we can't keep having the caregiving conversation slide off of the agenda. It has to be a real focus of our policymakers. Number five, the right to expect my loved ones, medical advisors and healthcare professionals to recognize my critical role as part of the primary and long-term care term team. This is so important. You know, we have HIPAA laws which protect the privacy of patients and their medical information cannot be shared with others without authorization. And I get that. But very often, sometimes our healthcare professionals will hide behind HIPAA and don't bring the family caregiver into the conversation. Um, And this is really detrimental to the overall health of the loved one, because the fact of the matter is that the, particularly the acute care part of our system, which would be our hospitals, uh, you know, our emergency rooms, they're going to treat your loved one in a very finite period of time, and then they're going to send them home or to rehab or to an assisted living or, or whatever it happens to be. And now someone else has to pick up that baton and care for your loved one. And so keeping you out of that link is detrimental to your loved one's health. We have to be in the, you know, in the care team, understanding what the needs are. Um, Also getting care training. Um, This is a big part of what ARP talked about with um, the CARE Act, which provides for training for family caregivers on that transition from hospital to home. All of these things are really important, but the, the family caregiver is just as important as any healthcare professional out there when it comes to caring for our older adults. Number six is the right to easily find resources that will help me in my caregiving journey. This is the bane of my existence because again, I've been doing this now for about 18, 20 years and it is still a fragmented system. It's so uh, frustrating to me because I keep waiting for some really brilliant entrepreneur to come up with a way to aggregate all of these different things that you need to think about because there are different things at different periods of time while you're caregiving and you have to go out there on the internet and do all your own research or try to you know get some referrals from friends or other you know co-workers and others who have maybe gone through caregiving but it may not be exactly right and maybe it's not up to date anyway it's a really frustrating experience to try to spend all this time and then even when you find things you're not quite sure that that is this the best thing is this you know is there a way for me to save money here we do have professionals called geriatric care managers who can help you navigate through a lot of this stuff but we still need to make it so much easier we need to find a way if not have a one-stop shop at least find ways to bring it more together and um you know i'm trying to do my little bit i put some resources up on my website but 
Um, that's not, you know, my primary focus, but I'm really encouraging entrepreneurs out there to take a look at this and help out our family caregivers with that uh, research that they need. And, and, and I should mention a lot of employers all often will offer research and referral sources. So check your employer first, because instead of you spending hours on the internet, you might be able to get a research and referral service to help you out with whatever your question or need is at that particular time through your employer. Number seven is the right to not take on the financial burden of caregiving all by myself. Okay, this is a tough one because very often the caregiving is a default. It falls to one person in the family, despite the fact you might have siblings or you've got a partner or spouse or adult children. All of these people could be helping out, but very often they don't. Caregiving seems to be a solo sport, but as much as we can, we need to make it a team sport. And the way that I write about that actually in my first book is to tap into the expertise and skills of the people around you. So, you know, if you have a uh, a, a brother who's a nurse or you have a sister who's a lawyer, you know, start signing them some things like, can you look over and make sure mom's got all of her legal documents in, in the right order or have your brother at least look at the medical bills and claims or go to the doctor appointment with your mom because he's going to be able to ask the right questions. Start tapping into your care team because they're going to give you not only peace of mind, but a little respite break. And I think it's really important. And the financial burden is a big one because a lot of times it does, again, fall on the shoulders of one caregiver, but this is where you need to reach out. And if your sister or brother lives across the country, you need to say, listen, I know you can't be here and I'm doing the physical lift when it comes to caregiving, but can you help pay for this? And, you know, don't be shy of reaching out and asking for that because the cost of care can be really overwhelming and very surprising to a lot of families. Number eight is the right to make choices that will help me manage my stress without feeling guilt or depression, that I'm focusing on myself at times rather than solely on my loved one. This is a huge one, right? It's the grief and guilt game that I think we all fall into as family caregivers. And we have to recognize that we can't keep up our energy, our stamina, our emotional health. We can't be there for everybody, including our employers, if we're just burning ourselves out. So you've got to get some time to just focus on you. Find those minutes, you know, during the week or a couple minutes every day where it's just about you. Get those respite breaks and have that balance in life because that is where we start to go down the well. And let's face it, if you become ill, you know, you catch a virus, you catch a cold or even something worse, you're not going to be able to be there to care for your loved one. And that's very frightening i think for a lot of us to contemplate because we have to be in this role so making sure that you're getting a little me time becomes really important and again part of my book is really focused around how do you do that because it's not just saying it i know that we say this to family caregivers and then the the response is okay how do i do it well that's hopefully what my book is going to help you with Number nine is the right to speak up and expect my close circle of friends and family to understand my caregiving role and to support me in any way they can. You know, very often we find that um, either we do it to ourselves or sometimes even our friends or family. You know, if you're not the life of the party and you're not fun and you can't come out and go to lunch or have coffee like normal or go to the gym or do this Pilates class or whatever it happens to be, you're just a downer. And, you know, well, OK, I'm, I, I don't have any interest in talking to you, which is a really shallow way for people to look at family caregivers. But it happens. So we really need to get that empathy going throughout our society so that people really understand, listen, if I really love this person, if this person really is a good friend and somebody I care about, I'm going to have to suck it up and realize my fun time might be, you know, a little uh, curtailed or whatever because my friend is going through this. So what can I do? What else can I do? Maybe I can go with her to care for her dad or, you know, play play bridge with him while she's making him lunch or whatever it is. And then we get some time as well. But whatever it is, have some kindness, have some empathy. And again, realize that we're all going to be in this caregiver role. So if it's not you today, it'll be you tomorrow. And you're going to expect that same kind of support that you have from your family and your circle of care and your friends. 
And number 10 is the right to expect life, liberty, and of course, the pursuit of happiness, even while so much of my time, energy, and attention is going to care for my loved one. You still have to find moments of joy. You still have to believe and, you know, in and be hopeful and find happiness. And sometimes you can bring your loved one along with you. One of my favorite stories that I tell in my book are the road trips, the spontaneous road trips that I took with my dad while he was in end stage cancer. And we would just, you know, drive around with the top down and have so much fun. I mean, doing something like that can really breathe again, new energy and give you these wonderful silver lining moments that you have while being a caregiver. It doesn't all have to be strife and challenging and frustrating. You can really find some happiness in being a caregiver. And this is the thought I want to leave you with. Um, as I mentioned several times, a lot of this is in my new book coming out uh, next month in August, the weekly Me Time Monday, the weekly wellness plan to find balance and joy for a busy life. I hope you check it out. And I just want to thank you for listening. And again, hope you enjoyed this episode of Caregiving Club on Air. Please listen to us. Actually, please subscribe to us. I don't say that enough. Please subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, wherever you're listening. And check out all the resources and article links on our episode guide page at caregivingclub.com. Just hit the podcast tab at the top and you'll see the latest episodes and the episode guide pages. And you can also email us with any comments or questions at podcast at caregivingclub.com. Take care and stay well.